I am Mahra Abbas from Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, and indeed it's a privilege and an honor to give this lecture at the 2020 SAGES meeting on endoscopic balloon dilatation of colorectal strictures. I have no financial disclosures to make related to this talk. In the next 15 minutes, uh, I would like to introduce you to the topic colorectal stricture and define the indication for balloon dilatation, describe the patient preparation and share with you the technical aspect of the procedure. And finally, we'll summarize the short and long-term result of this intervention. First, let's define the colorectal uh, stricture as an airing of the large bowel the symptoms can be summarized by the three Ds, diarrhea, difficulty with evacuation and constipation, distension and abdominal pain with bloating. If one surveys the literature in terms of diameter criteria, anything less than six to 10 millimeter is considered stricture. In my own practice, any symptomatic patient who has a stricture that I cannot traverse with a pediatric colonoscope is considered stricture. In terms of what causes colonic uh, and rectal stricture, prior surgical resection, atypical infections such as amoeba and tuberculosis, inflammatory bowel disease and diverticulitis, as well as ischemia. Malignancy with their primary adenocarcinoma of the colon or extra colonic or extra abdominal malignancy such as breast, esophagus, stomach, hepatobiliary, gynecologic or urologic can all cause carcinomatosis with extrinsic compression on the colorectum. And patient with prior history of radiation to the abdomen or pelvis can present with strictures. I evaluate the patient with colonoscopy to assess for disease activity, especially for patient with inflammatory bowel disease. CT scan with rectal contrast is a great modality to study these patients. An alternative is MRI scan of the abdomen and pelvis. And gastrographin enema is probably the most widely diagnostic imaging uh, test as it's readily available at most institutions. We're looking at the characteristic of the stricture in terms of location, morphology, diameter, length, and number of stricture, whether it's a single or multiple strictures. General consideration when trying to select a patient is to determine the type of symptom, frequency, and severity. It's important to define whether the balloon dilatation will be a temporizing measure to bridge the patient to future surgery or whether it will be a definitive intervention to take care of the problem. It's important to exclude malignancy, especially in patients with long-standing history of inflammatory bowel disease. So anything suspicious on colonoscopy examination should be biopsied. The ideal uh, candidate um, are patients who have an anastomotic type of stricture, a select group of patients with inflammatory bowel disease or ischemia. The main determinant for the candidacy of the patient is the morphology of the stricture. Ideally, you want to select patient with no active disease, especially in the setting of inflammatory bowel disorders. No significant surrounding fibrosis is important. The best stricture is a single stricture that is shorter than four centimeter. Contraindication, diverticulitis, uh, often there is a long uh, segment of disease bowel that require resection. Infectious related stricture are best treated medically. In the setting of uh, malignancy uh, and a patient undergoing stent placement, on rare occasion, one can uh, balloon dilate the area, but advise against it as there is an increased risk of perforation. And finally, patients with the radiation-induced stricture are not good candidate because often these strictures are long in a field of significant fibrosis and scarring, and thus they do not respond to balloon dilatation. The next few slides uh, demonstrate some case illustration. This patient, after a sigmoid resection for diverticulitis, presented with a very short stricture. This is a great candidate for one dilatation. As a matter of fact, this patient completely resolved the symptom after a single dilatation. 
This is a patient with Crohn's disease who has a longer stricture here, still a potential candidate, but it's important to counsel the patient that more likely than not, the patient will need more than one session to dilate the lesion. In this patient with a history of rectal cancer and prior radiotherapy to the pelvis and a previous anastomotic leak following low anterior resection, there is significant fibrosis and a persistent diverticulum posteriorly this patient is not a good candidate and will not respond to balloon dilatation. This is another case illustration of a patient with Crohn's disease. There's a long segment of transverse colon that is completely strictured. There's no role here for balloon dilatation. This patient should be taken to the operating room for resection. This is another case illustration from a patient with Crohn's disease. As demonstrated here by CT scan, there's significant amount of inflammation of the transverse colon, so there's a lot of active disease in a long segment. This patient would benefit from colectomy. The uh, first step of uh, preparation start with counseling the patient to set the right expectation, discuss the potential need for more than one procedure, also to discuss with the patient the potential need for surgery if complication or failure, informed consent need to be obtained for both the endoscopic procedure as well as surgical intervention. If done electively, I typically administer two enemas to the patient for a distal stricture. If it's a more proximal stricture, oral bowel preparation. However, in the emergency setting in a patient who has a dilated colon, I will only advise two enemas to clear the rectum. I performed the majority of these procedures in the endoscopy suite uh, with the help of a nurse who administer intravenous sedation. However, if it's an emergency situation with acute large bowel obstruction and significant dilatation of the small bowel, I prefer to perform these cases in the operating room with an anesthesia colleague for airway protection as there is a risk of aspiration. Having access to fluoroscopy equipment is very helpful. We use both disposable equipment in terms of balloon and wire, as well as a balloon insufflating device, which is the picture to the left. There's a, a gauge on, on the device uh, that uh, indicate the number of atmosphere. And typically on the packaging of the balloon, you would see the diameter size and which pressure you need to apply through the device to achieve such diameter. The patient is typically in the left lateral decubitus uh, position. I get to the lesion and cross the lesion with a wire. If I'm not certain whether the wire is antiluminal or not, I will inject some contrast through a catheter on the fluoroscopy, determine that indeed I'm antiluminally before performing three dilatation each for one minute. Usually we do it at three different diameter size. Each balloon provide insufflation at an interval of uh, three millimeters. So if you choose a balloon of eight, it can go to eight, nine, 10, a balloon of 10, 10, 11, 12. If you use a small uh, diameter balloon, that patient will need to come back for a second dilatation to a larger size in order to ensure long-term patency of the lumen. These case illustration uh, demonstrate the procedure. This first case patient post-sigmoidectomy for uh, diverticulitis, you see a pinpoint lumen in the left upper corner slide. The uh, lumen is accessed with the wire and then the balloon is uh, uh, driven uh, across with a catheter. Dilatation is performed three times and the end result is what you see in the right lower aspect of the slide, which is a very good result for the degree of stricture noted here. This is another patient uh, post-resection with a very tight stricture. Immediately after balloon dilatation, you see complete resolution of the stricture. And here we see the proximal aspect of the anastomosis, which is well perfused without any evidence of stricture or ischemia. Beyond the uh, scope of this talk are advanced um, balloon techniques such as endoscopic ballooning and strictureoplasty, which entail resecting a portion of the stricture. 
Uh, some cases require the placement of temporary stent to maintain adequate uh, lumen patency and rendezvous technique in patients who present with complete obstruction and a prior history of a stoma. Uh, one can access the stricture in an integrate fashion going through the distal limb of the stoma and then meet from below coming through the uh, anus and that's a rendezvous uh, procedure. Now, in terms of short and long-term result, this is uh, one of the largest series uh, in the literature, over 2,000 colorectal resection that led to a stricture in 76 patients. That's approximately 3% stricturing rate. Median time presentation was approximately five months. Half of the patient was successfully treated with one to two dilatation. Complication rate was approximately 16%, predominantly minor bleeding in the majority with one perforation. With a median follow-up of 11 years, recurrence rate was 11% at one year, it doubled at three years, and stabilized at five years at 25%. The patient had a median number of dilatation of three. Overall success rate was 97%, with a majority of patients managed endoscopically. Less than 3% required operation. The key message from this slide is that Endoscopic dilatation and stomatic stricture is highly successful, but it's important to follow the patient as it, up to 25% of them will redevelop stricturing that require additional intervention. This is another study looking at 42 patients undergoing 47 dilatation. 86% of them had complete improvement. Median follow-up was slightly over five years and recurrence rate was 9.5%. Moving on to inflammatory bowel disease, this multi-center study looked at nine tertiary center experience with Crohn's-related colorectal stricture. 60 stricture in 57 patients were described. The majority were on the left side in the native segment of colon. 13% were anastomotic stricture following resection. 65% of the stricture were less than five centimeter long. A total of 161 dilatation were performed in the study, on average three dilatation per patient. The immediate technical success was 76%. However, during a median follow-up of 4.3 years, 42% of the patient underwent colonic resection to develop subsequent malignancy, adenocarcinoma, and lymphoma. The key message here is that even though we can select some patient with inflammatory bowel disease for endoscopic balloon dilatation. It's important to counsel the patient approximately half at a time. They still are going to require surgical resection. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, endoscopic balloon dilatation has become a viable therapeutic option within our armamentarium of therapy for patient with colorectal stricture. Patient selection is key in order to increase success rate, and I define to you the indication and contraindication for uh, this uh, intervention. The ideal patient is a patient who has an asthmatic stricture that is uh, short in a field that is not fibrotic, stricture, or radiated. It's important to counsel the patient about more than one intervention, and in a subgroup of patients, the need for subsequent surgeries especially those with inflammatory bowel disease. And finally, it's important to note that as we continue to evolve our experience with therapeutic endoscopy, we will be managing more and more of these cases with the endoscopy, especially as we introduce newer technology in the field of therapeutic endoscopy. Thank you very much for your attention and I do hope that many of you would visit my beautiful city, Dubai, a city of the future, as shown here with the Museum of the Future that is about to open. Thank you very much.